Welcome, everyone. I'm Fred Kaiser, your host at the Fast Team National Resource Center and FA Production Studios at the Sun and Fun Complex in Lakeland, Florida. An exciting Sun and Fun has been so far. We still have a few more days left, and it's just going to get better, better, and better. Just a couple of housekeeping items. We talked a little bit about evacuating the building and this kind of stuff. Don't forget your cell phones. There'll be questions at the end of all the presentations, okay? Time for, time for questions and answers. Before you start speaking, wait for someone to get a microphone to you so everyone captures your question. That way we can, we, we can, we can, we can make sure everybody hears it. Um, there'll be a sign-in sheet in the back in case you've signed up on fasafety.gov to make sure that you have or will get credit for this presentation. Okay, our next presenters, Earth Platinum Aviation, a Cirrus Standardization Training Center at Opelika Airport in Miami. They're the leading flight training center to offer TAA instruction. Tina was the 2007 Southern Region CFI of the Year, and Carrie is the Master CFI. Their topic today is flying the glass cockpit, and frankly, I can think of nothing more important than getting, them, getting these guys on the stage so that we can find out more about flying the glass cockpit. So please, let's welcome Tina and Carrie. Thanks for a nice introduction, Fred. Uh, we're from Platinum Aviation, and he said at Opelika Airport, uh, where uh, we just uh, opened a new uh, premier facility at uh, FXC. Uh, if any of you have, you've been there, it's the old Banyan facility, and uh, invite anybody to come out there and see that. Um, we have uh, this is Tina. She was, like he said, the 2007 flight instructor of the year uh, for the Southern Region. Uh, I put 2006 on the presentation. She reminded me this morning that I was wrong. We're both Cirrus standardized instructors. Between the two of us, we probably give more Cirrus instruction annually than anybody. And this is Kerry. Kerry Hagney is our chief pilot. He's a former NAFI master flight instructor, CFII, uh, MEI, ATP, and a Cirrus standardized instructor pilot. He's also a lead FAA FAST team representative. We're both very active in the uh, FAST team. That's our contact information. I'll put it back up at the end if anybody wants to contact us after this. We're here to talk about instructing, they said instructing in glass cockpit airplanes, but also examining in glass cockpit airplanes. Uh, what the DPEs should know and uh, the differences in these kinds of airplanes. So we'll talk about what's so different. We get a lot of instructors that come to our facility that want to teach in these planes, and they don't really understand that there's a big difference in the way you go about it and how you teach in these planes. We'll talk about what's different with the applicants. Um, this is skewed a little bit towards Cirrus because that's what we do about 90% of our stuff with. Uh, but the, uh, the applicants we find are a bit different. And we'll talk about how that affects the training and uh, the safety and everything involved with it. And how it affects the pilots and you and anybody out there that's an instructor. You want to take the aircraft? Sure. First, we'll talk a little bit about the aircraft. Um, most of the technologically advanced aircraft are much faster. The Cirrus and the Columbia, well, now the Cessna 400 and all. They're much faster, and it makes, makes the airplane that's more capable, and people are going to use and go places faster after they get a private pilot's license, and that figures into this vastly. Uh, they're much more sophisticated systems due to the sophisticated avionics. Um, You've got some, some of the aircraft have two alternators, two batteries, um, maybe four moving maps at one time in the aircraft, uh, and it can be a lot to keep up with, especially for an instructor. You know, typically people that were getting their private pilot's license were doing it in a 172 or a very simple airplane. Tina and I and our instructors, we routinely teach people from zero time in SR-22 turbos that go 219 knots and up to 25,000 feet. So we're having to prep these people that we're going to turn loose on a solo in a plane in a complex high-performance airplane, well not complex, the gear doesn't come up, but high-performance airplane that is not typical of what private pilots solo in. So you have to have them trained to a higher level before you ever turn them loose. The high altitude operation. You just touched on yeah. that, yeah. Uh, what, these aircraft are generally way less tolerant for bad airmanship. Um, in some of these sophisticated aircraft, you're not going to be able to get away with um, 
bad airmanship with, you know, slightly not so great landings or, well, that was good enough. Um, good enough in these aircraft has really got to be spot on. It's got to be done exactly the way it, it should be. And it figures into the faster thing, too. I mean, like I say, you got a low time guy. I mean, just tuning the knobs and tuning the frequencies in these planes, 30 miles can go by before they get put in what they need to get put in. So they got to be way ahead of things. Uh, the aircraft are much more capable. Um, and this kind of leads into another area of teaching where, because they are so capable, they're designed to be flown from point A to point B. They're designed to be a traveling machine. Um, we as instructors have to work with the PTS, but the aircraft is much more capable than what the PTS calls for. Um, they, they are cross-country machines. Yep. Now the applicants, and like I say, this is skewed serious because that's what we do, but uh, We've dealt with this, this, uh, this group of people for a long time, Tina and I have, and they're, they're all highly successful. You know, they're, they're renting an airplane to learn how to fly, and some of them are renting an airplane that's you know, $350 an hour plus the instructor to get their private pilot license in, so it's a little different. Um, they're, I put up here that they're motivated and goal-oriented. A lot of them, you know, you, you say, yeah, all pilots that are wanting to learn to fly are, but some of our people buy the plane before they even know anything and they, they have a mission in mind, something they want to do. They're tired of the airlines and they're doing this to have reliable transportation. So until we can get them their instrument rating and let them loose safely and even get some time under the belt with that, we got to keep a tight rein on them because of that. They're very intelligent people. They're successful and goal-oriented, intelligent. Um, they've gotten where they are in life and where they can afford to buy and fly these aircraft for a reason. And therefore, they expect learning to fly to be something that they can accomplish rather quickly, just like some of the other things that they do, and that they can be successful at it right away, like they are in their business or in their, their work that they do. And this can, can bring something else to the table when you're dealing with these people and teaching these people how to fly. Um, they, this generally doesn't come that easily to them, and we have to end up telling them no on, uh, on a certain level. And they're not used to having someone tell them no, or they're not used to being good at something right away. So this brings another level of, uh, of instruction, to, uh, instruction to the table. You know, a lot of, it, it takes, we find this when we try to hire other instructors, you know, the, the younger group. It, uh, it takes a pretty powerful instructor to stand up to some of these people. They're very highly successful businessmen. Uh, and to tell them no, they shouldn't go today is sometimes a difficult thing. Uh, they're much more likely to use the aircraft in a real way sooner. That's part of the reason why they've sought out this type of aircraft, the technologically advanced aircraft, is they have a mission. They are learning to fly and buying the aircraft because they have a need and a mission to get from point A to point B, whether it's for work and they're tired of the airlines, or it's for family. They have houses in different locations throughout the U.S. or the islands, and they're fully expecting the day they get their ticket to load the plane up, get in it, and go somewhere on a trip, on a real-world trip. And the, uh, the old thing in aviation that instructors all had to worry about, you know, to get their itis and counseling people not to get that mentality applies in these planes far more than it does in the, in the little planes that people were running around getting $100 hamburgers in. Because like I say, well, they had these missions in mind and they were getting their plane. I just had a guy, got his private pilot uh, just a couple weeks ago and he went off and went to Boston from Miami on his, one of his first trips. Uh, it's just not what you usually see. Uh, the teaching process, um, don't ignore the technology. This is something that I see a lot. I fly with a lot of instructors uh, every week. And this is one of the big issues with instructors that are even have a lot of time in the high technology aircraft. I just flew with a gentleman this week. He's got about a thousand hours in Cirrus aircraft. And I, I don't know if he was purposely trying to go against the technology, but the way everything was set up, the um, multifunction display, the two GPSs, none of it was set up to help him with the flight. None of it was set up properly. And when I questioned him on how he had the, the item set up, the avionics set up, his answer to me was simply, well, you know, I used to teach in a 1972 Warrior. And, you know, I, I can fly without all this stuff. And my answer to him was, well, yeah, I used to teach in a 72 Warrior as well. And I cherish the fact that I have traffic and a moving map 
and all the technology here and let's get it set up where it can help us and benefit us on our flight. And I had even a little difficulty convincing him that it's there for a reason and to kind of embrace the technology. So we run into that. And you're, and you're cheating your student if you don't. I mean, they, they're flying these kind of planes for a reason. They're, cap they're highly capable and you need to embrace that and show them how to work it. Uh, we get a lot of people that come to us that learn somewhere else and we find that they know very little about even the most basic things about the autopilot, for example. And they'll say to us, oh, my instructor told me I really shouldn't be using the autopilot. Well, you know, if it's in the plane, you need to know how to work it. And you need to know how to work it flawlessly. Um, being an expert, if you're teaching in these planes especially, um, or even just flying in them, you really need to be an expert at the technology and what's available in your aircraft. Um, this, I ran into a situation two weeks ago where I was flying with another pilot in a very sophisticated aircraft, and we had an abnormal situation in IMC and terrain uh, up in Montana, and he completely reverted back to the old standard VOR, you know, swinging needle, uh, let's tune in the ADF, um, and we had full FMS available. We had a terrain pages on, uh, on our PFDs. And this person, if, if you're not an expert at the, at the technology that's in the aircraft all the time, if anything abnormal happens, you're leaving yourself really open for uh, something bad to happen. You know, and if you're an instructor, as an instructor, you need to learn this, uh, the avionics in the airplane so flawlessly that you can do anything with it by talking your student through it without touching a single knob. Because if you're the one always touching the knobs and turning things, they're never going to learn it. And you, need to, you absolutely need to learn how to do that before you teach in these airplanes. Um, these aircraft call for a lot of creativity in the teaching process as well. Yeah, we kind of, like our, our private pilots, I kind of joke around sometimes that we actually do it backwards from a traditional airplane, the whole process. Because in a, in a simple airplane, you, do, you take them out and you do the normal things, and by the time you teach them how to land, they don't know how to go anywhere. And in our airplanes, uh, from lesson one, we go somewhere. We get them into the button pressing process, entering flight plans, although a simple one, just to a destination. But every single time we go somewhere, it's more scenario-based. It's not maneuver-based. Uh, so they're making critical decisions about what's, the, what's going on when things go wrong, for example. Uh, staying up to date. Staying up to date with the latest technology that's changing. Every, every day it seems like it's changing. And it's yeah. very difficult to, to stay up to date with the systems in the aircraft that, that we're flying. Tina and I give these presentations a lot. I'm getting to the point to where I, I tell everybody anything that I say today doesn't, doesn't have anything to do with this tomorrow. It's really amazing because in the old days, airplanes, you had to have an airframe change or an engine change, which was a big thing before anybody had to learn anything new. Now it's just a bunch of ones and zeros in a computer and the whole thing operates completely different. You get an 11 year old program in this thing and, it, and you got a whole different technology. And quite frankly, I don't know how anybody, other than people that do this all day, every day, can keep up with this stuff. And we even have a hard time and keeping up at time. times. Now, we got advantages up here, and we've given these presentations a lot and talked about the advantages of these airplanes. In this particular case, we're not talking about the advantages of the airplane so much. We're talking about the advantages the airplane gives the instructor from the instructor point of view. Uh, situational awareness. If you're teaching instrument, uh, an instrument student, for example, you can see far out, you know, your situational awareness, where you're at, and you can plan what you're trying to do and the situation you're trying to set the, the student up for. Works out really well. Traffic avoidance is the same way. Um, you know, we have active traffic in these planes. It makes it, you know, in an instrument situation, you're forced as an instructor to be looking inside a lot because you have to point to things and show them what to do. At the same time, you can't get suckered into the idea that the traffic is always going to work. If the other guy doesn't have his transponder on, guess what? And it happens a good bit. It all contributes to the overall safety. I, I feel much safer in these planes. I really do when I'm out teaching in them. And it makes for easier transitions between aircraft. Once you know one system, and we're going to get into this a little bit about how they present in different airplanes. Um, you know, when you're jumping into a new plane, the first thing is where to look. Once you, that's the first thing you got to learn is where to look and you get, so you can get your information fast. 
And in these planes, I find it real easy. You jump into one that's similarly equipped and the transition is much easier. Um, and we'll talk about this last one here in a minute. Do you want to add anything to those things I talked about, Tim? No, I think you covered it pretty good. Uh, flight instructors have always been known as a, as a field where people worked until they could get a, a real job. And so they never were able to charge any kind of realistic rates. Um, this, this whole thing has changed that, and I think we're proof of it. The, uh, if you really are an expert in what we're doing, because there's only 500 or so Cirrus instructors around, but if you're a true expert in it, you'll be sought out so much that you can charge realistic rates. Uh, she and I always had a waiting list of people wanting to train with us because everybody knew that, that we knew this better than anybody. And so if you're an instructor and you want to make a living at it, become an expert at these things. Disadvantages, again, to the instructor. Too much time with the eyes inside the cockpit. This is probably the biggest one, I would say. Uh, there's so much to look at in there and there's, it takes um, a lot of flying time as an instructor to know instinctively exactly where you need to look for what information it is you're, you're seeking out. Um, and it's very easy to just keep your eyes glued inside the cockpit with all the maps and the traffic and, and to get lazy with it. Yeah, you know, that's a common thing you tell, tell student pilots, you know, but then as an instructor, you find yourself getting, I won't say lazy, but you're in there trying to teach the guy the the very material that you don't want him to look at. You know, you're saying look outside, but no, you need to look inside to learn this stuff. So, and there's more of it than in a conventional airplane. And it leads to increased cockpit distractions in a high traffic environment. Um, you gotta be careful. Uh, there's this way too much to look at inside on the screens. Anything to add to that one? Nope. You wanna talk about that, I know. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> information overload. Um, this is expected when people, the first few flights in the aircraft, uh, whether they're a student pilot or a seasoned instructor, um, everybody's going to go through the information overload because you don't know the sequence of events of the avionics. You don't know where you need to be looking and so forth. Um, this happens with, I see it a lot with instructors that have maybe, I don't know, 50 to 100 hours teaching in the Cirrus or the glass cockpit and we'll go out and do a flight, do a check flight, and I can see them managing the, um, the avionics and managing what's going on in the aircraft, but then having to make a radio call becomes a little difficult for them. They have to think about making the radio call as to where they are and all that because of they're overloaded with all the, the avionics that they're going through and, and trying to teach. So we see this a lot. Now, let, let's talk about it from the student side for a minute. Um, the, uh, you say, well, what would it be like to learn how to fly in one of these airplanes that has all these buttons? Because there's a lot to look at. Uh, and I, I, when we first started doing this, I wondered that and wondered where that would go. Uh, quite honestly, it doesn't make a difference. A guy that doesn't know how to fly doesn't know how to fly. And you stick him in the plane and you say, this is it. He doesn't know any better. That's it. And that's what he knows he has to learn. Uh, some of the most difficult ones we have are the higher time pilots that have flown simple planes for a long time. Uh, those tend to be harder people to get checked out in these kinds of airplanes. They're kind of fixed in their ways and they don't really want to embrace this. Even if they want to, they're just, they're just not doing it. Lack of currency really plays into these planes. Uh, the analogy I use is, uh, is my remote control for my television at home with my home theater unit. Has a lot of buttons on it that I hardly ever use. And if I roll over on it when I'm sleeping and my TV goes off, it takes me 30 minutes to get the thing back on. The, uh, sometimes I can't get it back on, got to call for help. But these planes have an equivalent amount of buttons in them. And I fly them every day, all day. And sometimes I wonder what it's like for the guy that flies it, you know, once a week trying to learn. Or even worse, the guy that owns one and, or only rents one and he flies it once a month. We're a little more strict about our renters because of that they have to keep up a little more currency than most renters. I know it even happens to us. Um, I'm yeah. primarily teaching in the uh, Avidine system and when I have a student in the G1000 system, if I haven't flown the G1000 in a month or a month and a half, I'm going home the night before with the G1000 book and I'm reading it and I'm reading the notes that I took when I went to G1000 school because 
I'm, I'm not going to know where to tell him what button to push or so forth. And, uh, and I'm doing it every day. I still have to take it home and study it. And like, like me, I mean, I got thousands of hours of teaching in these things. In Platinum, we just did a major renovation of the place and opened that new big facility, and that was a huge deal. And I was involved in a lot of that and wasn't doing much flying for the past two and a half months, I suppose. And I flew some, but then when I got in the plane and started actively instructing hardcore again, I was like, wow, this, this really does need emphasizing. <laughs> Oof, constantly changing technology. Uh, like he had mentioned earlier, you know, what we say today might not even be valid tomorrow because the software is changing so quickly. Um, you can fly one Avidyne or one, one Garmin in an older aircraft that doesn't have the latest or the few latest software updates and the presentation is going to be slightly different where some of your, um, your engine instruments or your, your map or um, destination, ETA, some, just some little things are going to change through software updates that people might not have done in an older aircraft. Yeah. Well, even like the ones that have, you know, say a Cirrus with Avidyne with WAS or one that doesn't have WAS. For the instrument guys, you know, what's it going to do? Is it going to fly the hole by itself? Is it going to do the procedure turn by itself on autopilot? You know, what's it going to do? And as an instructor, you need to know what it's going to do, not wait till it happens. You need to be four steps ahead of the guy. And unless you know how the software that's loaded into that particular airplane, you don't know until you see it happen. Uh, which brings up uh, DPEs or instructors flying in planes they're unfamiliar with. They need to ask some questions before they get there and know the right questions to ask about how this plane's equipped. Similar avionics systems differ greatly between aircraft. That's one of the things we're going to get into here in a minute. Uh, so you've flown a Cirrus SR-20 with Avidyne, and now you're going to hop into a Saratoga and go. Same stuff. Well, not really, and we'll talk about that. Uh, Tina and I both, we've got a lot of experience in the G-1000 stuff, and I, that's probably the, the thing that most people have have this got glass cockpit experience have flown? How about the people here today? How many people have flown glass cockpit airplanes? How many of them were Garmin and the Avidyne stuff? So Garmin leads the way in the, amongst this group anyway. And that's kind of where the, most of the manufacturers are kind of heading in various ways. Um, I would say that the G1000 stuff is less intuitive. Uh, you need to learn it better before you actually use it. The Avidyne's more intuitive. You can see everything is right in front of you. If you don't know how to do it, you can typically can read what's on the screen and figure it out. Uh, G1000 is not that way. Anything else you want to add to that? Nope, just the G1000 is even tra uh, changing. Yeah. I mean, you know, whether it has the autopilot or whether it has WAS. But the, uh, I think most people's initial experience with this stuff is is the Cessna type product, a 172 with a G1000. It's still a slow airplane. It gives you a lot of time to punch the buttons and figure things out. Like I say, our private pilots that are flying a 22 turbo, they're moving along pretty quick. And it is, it's amazing to me sometimes that we get halfway across the state before a, you know, a student gets something figured out that I know they should know. And I'm still coaching them along and they were halfway across the state before we get going in the direction we're supposed to be going. And talk about changing in technology, that's basically, you know, the Garmin perspective, it's, a, it's a, in the Cirrus, it's a very nice system. It's based on the G1000, a lot of things work, this, work the same, but it's a lot different. Uh, there's a lot more technology there. As an instructor, there's a whole lot more you need to be uh, versed in how to operate. Uh, as an instructor teaching a private pilot from scratch, zero time in that thing, uh, it's going to be quite a chore and the instructor better be super sharp or things are going to get behind. And super patient. And super patient. <laughs> <laughs> the patience uh, level that it takes sometimes in these things uh, is a good, good bit more than in conventional airplanes. We might be a half an hour on the ground on the first few lessons with somebody in this aircraft before we're ready to get to the hold short and, t and take off. It, it might take even a half hour. Yeah, sometimes I look at the Hobbs meter right before we take off, I look back at it and I'm like, whew, that was a long time. Yeah. But you can't, you can't rush them, they won't get it. You can't get impatient. I, I know from, from my own experience and other people I've talked to, 
a lot of instructors, to me, in a conventional airplane, the, th the panel that is least understood is the audio panel because most instructors get in a hurry and are punching the buttons for the app or for the student. And this thing is like one giant audio panel. You can't get in, impatient and start pressing the buttons for the people. You've got to talk them through it, let them, have the, let them make mistakes, and let them see by the way of their error. If they punch in an error, let them leave the error there when it's safe to do so, and let them make the mistake and see what the result of that error is. It's really important to teach them to set and verify. Don't set and assume in these things. <clears throat> That's the standard um, Avidyne display system. It's got the uh, two separate GPS units that you can, you can manage individually. I actually like that feature. I like being able to set that up however I want to. Now the thing is about these, you know, these two, you know, two same planes, you know, Cirrus SR-22, same thing. Uh, but as a, say as an examiner, you know, the way you examine in these planes uh, varies greatly between the one we just showed and this one. How do you, uh, how do you have an instrument student do a failure? Uh, in the serious perspective, it's very difficult. There's so many redundancies to that thing, you almost can't make a realistic failure happen in that airplane. Uh, in, in this Avidyne system, there's a lot of backups. Uh, but there's a proper procedure that you would need to know, and you know, we don't have it an hour to go through each and every one of these. But what I'm seeing is, is DPEs not properly examining people because yeah, they just don't know. We end up teaching our students how to handle the failures properly by shutting things down, pulling circuit breakers, and going through the proper procedure with a failure. And then we also have to prepare them for that on their check ride. The DPE is probably not going to allow them to actually shut some systems down and pull the actual circuit breakers and it's completely different procedure if you're not actually shutting the system down or pulling the uh, the appropriate in, circuit breakers in particular what she's talking talking about that would easiest to explain is the autopilot on this plane here uh, if you have a pfd failure the proper procedure is to pull the two circuit breakers that control that pfd and get it out of the system because you don't know when it's feeding false information to the autopilot uh, well, the autopilot behaves differently with those two circuit breakers pulled. So if you've got an applicant that knows how to do it the correct way, and then the examiner does not let him pull those circuit breakers, then he can't do what he's trained to do. He has to do it some other way and make it up. So we have to train him for both ways in case the guy doesn't let him do it the right way. And that's kind of messed up. We need to get everybody on the same page here. <laughs> Uh, the, this is one of the Piper products, the Archer, which shows the basic Avidyne system. Um, this system, however, has one electrical bus, uh, whereas the Cirrus has the two. So if you're transitioning from one aircraft to the other, this system has the one alternator and one main battery. The attitude indicator in this aircraft works off of its own standby battery. Um, you can purchase another another battery for the aircraft, but it, it doesn't another come alternator. standard. Another alternator, but it doesn't come standard. So if the emergency procedures or abnormal procedures in this Avidyne plane are going to be significantly different than that in another aircraft with the same avionics system. And even some of the display information is different on this Avidyne as far as the Cirrus Avidyne. Um, you'll see you've got like a little engine gauge on the upper left hand corner of the PFD and some of the little snippets of information are displayed in different places on the PFD and the MFD as compared to in a Cirrus or another aircraft with Avidyne. One thing as an instructor, I, I, I feel fortunate that we kind of came up through this through the Cirrus side because they've been real supportive in providing very documented standardized procedures for how to teach in these planes. And when we first uh, started doing it with Cirrus, we, we adopted their procedures for all the planes that we teach in. And that's, they've done a real good job of controlling who can teach in the planes that know it well. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, about how in a lot of the other airplanes, just any old Joe can get in there, jump in there, and start teaching. It's kind of a little case of the blind leading the blind in a lot of ways. And when you're talking about a private pilot that's not instrument rated, well, that's one thing. But when we get into an instrument rated pilot, it gets to be a little bit more. 
Uh, the Malibu Meridian turboprop, it's currently utilizing the Avidyne, and once again, it's another type of layout for the Avidyne. So it's even different from their Saratoga, it's different from the Cirrus, but yet it's still, it's still Avidyne. How they, in, a, in a lot of cases, it's how the autopilot behaves to a PFD failure. That's a lot of, lot of what it boils down to. Yeah, that that's and the a electrical very big one. system. But, um, you know, if, if you don't know what your autopilot's going to do when the PFD fails, and I'll tell you, uh, you know, people that haven't flown glass, that's their biggest thing. They go, you know, what if all this fails? Quite frankly, it's so backed up. It works. If you know how to handle it, it's, it's a non-event. But you really need to know how it's all hooked together, how the systems are hooked together. And if you do, it's a non-event. If you don't, it's a big event. Uh, the King Air 90, the new ones, the GTI, they're utilizing even yet another form of new technology for their displays. Um, this is what you'll see in more of, more of the jets if you're transitioning upward. And this is just yet another completely different system to learn and manage and read at night before you fly it the next day. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have the opportunity and privilege to fly one of these and it's, I, it is a wonderful system, but I find in many ways that we have, we're more equipped and a little easier to manage the systems in the smaller uh, general aviation aircraft like the G1000 and the Avidyne are a little more intuitive and have a little more of the tools readily at hand for you than even this advanced system does for when people are stepping up. And you're gonna, you know, the, the, the general aviation, I said general aviation, the smaller planes, Cirrus, Columbia's, Pipers and things, those planes, the systems that are in those look like these but they're easier to work and but the funny thing is, is these more expensive, more capable systems have less functionality in them in a lot of ways. And the interesting thing is with, it, with our clientele, we're gonna, we see them moving up into you know, turboprop airplanes, Pilatuses, things like that, and they all of a sudden jump from the easy to operate into this kind of stuff. And it's, it's a big jump for somebody that doesn't have a lot of time. And I think we're bringing down the time you know, people used to have to build up higher and higher times before they could get into complex, air, more complex airplanes that really go fast. And I think we're seeing a time because of this glass cockpit stuff that it's bringing that timeline down and you're gonna see lower time people in more complex airplanes. That is the trend and that's what's happening. Well, the pilot of this one. The pilot of this one. <laughs> He's, he just broke 500 hours um, and probably 200 hours of those 500 are in this brand new King Air 90 GTI. Yeah, I just so, got him his multi-engine rating not long ago. How, last May, a year ago. Yeah, and now he's in a King Air 90 GTI. So. He, he's not flying it around by himself, um, but he's... He will be. He will be <laughs> in the very near future. And that's, we're seeing more and more of that with the, with the people that go through these technologically advanced aircraft. When I went to school for this airplane, I was like, all right, let's check out... Uh, when I was doing avionics training, I said, well, let's see what the weather's doing at our destination and see what it's doing at the airports near our destination because this is a luxury I have in the Cirrus and the Cessna and the Piper with their glass panels. And everybody at Flight Safety looked at me. I was like, what? You can't do that. <laughs> I was like, it was like, you're kidding me. They said, this fancy system and we can't see what's going on out there. And they're like, oh, no, you can't do that. So A lot of this technology is there to try to make more people able to use airplanes as traveling machines. I mean, I know that's Cirrus's dream. And, and that's, they've got the Cirrus jet coming out. And like I say, it's bringing down the time level of what, when people could actually possibly fly these things. And if you're an instructor and you're dealing with people that are going to work their way up through the ranks of airplanes, it's going to happen much faster. And um, when the Cirrus jet comes out in a couple years, you're going to have low time people. And then you got the problem that even if they get the jet, they're going to have to have a type rating because it is a jet and type ratings have to be flown to ATP standards. So if you're teaching somebody that uh, that's their, where they're heading, you got to be real tough on them right from day one to fly very professionally. Uh, one of the things that Tina and I do is I think most flight schools the bigger ones particularly are teaching people to be airline pilots. So you're really training somebody to be a right seater. You're not teaching them to be a pilot in command. And then that's even in a two pilot operation. What we're doing, almost all our clients, we're teaching them to be single pilot, IFR, low time, 
probably moving into a jet at low time. So you have to have a higher standard right from day one. Well, and at the very least, from day one, these people flying the technologically advanced aircraft, they're going to be out, they're out there in the system the day they get their certificate. They're out there filing IFR, loading up their families. They're out there on the airways with, with you and I. I mean, they're going somewhere. They're the decision makers now. You know, we have to train them from day one to be able to fly the aircraft and be the decision maker, take responsibility for our, everything that's going on, which can be quite challenging. And we talked about moving into the Mustang jet. It was one of our instructors right now is that at Flight Safety doing it with, with a customer uh, transitioning into this thing. And uh, he texted Tina the other day <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> about the difficulty the customer was having with this because he thinks it's so simple. It looks like what he's got, but not screaming along at 350 or whatever. Yeah, and the customer, he learned from scratch in uh, G1000. So he's familiar with the avionics and he's still having a difficult time, the owner of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. This presentation we're given is uh, a variant of one that I just gave recently at, at FISDO 19's uh, annual DPE meeting because uh, Tina and I both uh, teach the inspectors down there at our FISDO about these planes. And the point that I keep making to people, and I think they're getting it, is it's to the point with these things that I don't see how an inspector can walk up and ramp a guy and know what he's looking at. I just don't know how it's possible. Um, they're changing so fast and us doing it professionally every day of the week and she and I are incessant readers about this stuff. Um, I don't know how you can keep up. And DPEs, same thing with them. Um, they, uh, they need to learn the stuff before they, the, their name is going to be the last name in that book and if somebody, something happens to one of their applicants that they sign off on and then something happens to him, uh, the lawyers are going to be going back and going, who signed off on this guy last? How much time did you have on this airplane? So need to be thinking about that stuff. And you know, here, here's a third system that uh, Cirrus looked at seriously there for a while. This is the L3. And in the end, uh, you know, I was talking to some people there and they really liked the system, but in, in the end, I'm not, not talking for them, but in the end, it boiled down to how you're going to train all the Cirrus instructors out there and keep everybody comfortable on three different systems because you just keep adding these different systems out there. And it was a very good system, but it's hard enough keeping up with what we got. So it kind of comes down to specialization. You know, with planes under 12.5 that aren't jets, you don't need a type rating. And uh, an uh, instructor can just jump in any one of those. You know, if he's a single engine airplane, here we go. But uh, do you really know it? And then maybe is it coming time, you know, Cirrus has forced it upon us. I mean, we have to be Cirrus instructors. That designation only lasts a year. It has to be renewed. We go to conventions every year. Um, but the CFI that's out there that's not part of that program, is it time for people to think about specializing in certain types of equipment? And then if you do, then you can be in high demand and charge more money and make a living at it and not be pressing on towards some other career. Anything you want to add to that? No. So, you know, how does all this technology and affect the training requirements? I kind of touched on that a little bit about, you know, that we got to train them to a higher standard because where most of these people are headed. You want to take that? Well, clearly systems knowledge is important as we've been discussing. You need to be able to, to know and be prepared um, what's going to happen when you have a failure and how everything is tied in together so that you, you know how to do um, the procedures properly. Well, I tell my people first thing, you know, when we, because a lot of the training we do with these things is failures once they know how to, you know, when we're doing transition people that know how to fly already. And I teach them, you know, you, you can't fix something unless you know what's broken and then how that interfaces with everything else. And then warning lights when they come on. These things are electrical, they're computers. I mean, you all have computers and you know how they misbehave. You know, if a light comes on, oil pressure light or alternator failure light or something, you almost got to assume that it isn't so just for a minute. And then go to a page that tries to prove that it is so through some other, other gauge or method. Uh, don't be so quick to jump to a, you know, oil pressure light comes on and I've seen people <laughs> I've seen people just declare their own emergency that wasn't. And I kept telling them you know, in a simulation, I said, the motor's still running. It's just the light that's on. And they keep pressing on into what eventually would have been an off-airport 
crash for a uh, simple light malfunction came on. You know, all you had to do is go to the engine page and see that temps are all under control, everything's cool. It's a faulty light, but uh, you see that a lot. You do. The button and knobology are key. <sighs> Uh, we can't say that one enough. Knowing what button and what knob is going to get you the end result that you want. And this is something that only just seat time is really going to get you. I see instructors try to sit in the aircraft with uh, external power and try to go through everything and hang or fly sitting in the aircraft. And until they get up in the air and go through it in, in a real scenario. Cross countries. Cross countries. Um, they, they just don't they won't get it until they get in the plane and start flying it. Once you basically know these planes, the best thing to do is get in and go on a long cross country, a nice safe one, and uh, easy one. And just start pushing and buttons. And just start pushing buttons. The GPS that you're not using, play with it. Make sure it's not on cross fill and just keep playing with the thing. Um, as an instructor, if you're gonna get in a plane in actual instrument conditions, you better know this stuff super fast because the, the student will mess it all up and you've got to be able to put it back in fast. Uh, so you, you can't have any hesitation if you're an instructor in these things. You've got to know it very well. Um, the ability to handle the failures, we've been talking about that a lot. Yeah, that's pretty much it. If you're transitioning somebody in one of these planes, that's the big, big thing. Yeah. The ability to hand fly and manage the systems. Um, that's a lot, a lot of buttons to push, and ever you know, and these planes are intended to be flown on autopilot. But we all know they fail at the most inopportune times. <laughs> we had I, one one guy that uh, that happened to. He got his instrument ticket and mm. blasted off in uh, really bad weather, and his autopilot failed as soon as he went in the clouds. First week out of the box. Luckily, I was behind him and talking to him in another airplane. <laughs> but. Um, it, they can be a handful when you have uh, an autopilot failure, and it, like he said, it's never going to happen you know, on a, on a clear VFR day, never. It's always going to happen at the worst time. It happened to myself and another pilot last week uh, up in Montana in, in absolute blizzard, uh, IMC, quarter mile visibility, we take off, autopilot failed, we had another issue with the aircraft before the autopilot failure. And now we've got to reset all the, the FMS system. We've got to redo all of our navigation while keeping the aircraft, you know, wings level and right side up and dealing with ATC. Um, it can be a handful resetting all of the electrical stuff. If you don't know it inside out and backwards, you're, you can get upside down really quick. And see, you know, as an instructor, it's a fine line you got to walk talking, teaching your, uh, your students because you know, do you say, I want you to hand fly this thing most all the time so you learn how to hand fly it? They really need to know how to work the autopilots, how the plane's intended to be flown. And if it's, it's operated incorrectly, it can get you in a lot of trouble. I mean, I, I could go on for a whole nother hour about stupid things I've seen people do. Uh, gets back to that set and verify thing. I mean, I took off one time out of Fort Lauderdale exec and the guy, he's pressing the buttons and then he gets his head down in the cockpit because he's slow about turning the knobs. And if, if I hadn't have been there, we would have crashed into Pompano Air Park on autopilot because that's how he set it up. You know, he set it up to descend in a turn and he's got his head down in the cockpit looking at the GPS that he's slow about tuning in. So you gotta teach, you gotta take, learn, figure out where that fine line is between hand flying and, and automation, but and don't, uh, don't ignore the technology and make them just hand fly it. Ability to properly manage the automation. This is probably the biggest key, I think, to flying these aircraft is properly managing the automation. Um, people just seem to get uh, tangled up in it. They they uh, they do. They get tangled up. Uh, I mean, if you got the airport in sight, you don't need to be flying on autopilot. You know, if you're VFR. And I see that all the time. I just I'll just wait and let it go and see how long it's going to last. I mean, I think they would turn base on autopilot. It's, it's ridiculous sometimes. Another one that drives me crazy is we've been going for 100 miles direct to the airport. The airport is straight ahead. And they, they'll, they'll look at the map, they'll start looking for the airport, and they'll look to the left. I've never figured it out. Almost all of them do it. I've seen them where they look at the moving map display, 
the airport is clearly off of our left wing and they're looking straight ahead trying to find the airport. They don't use, it's amazing to have that much technology and they'll ignore it um, or even use it in a weird kind of way. Well, and you can, like flying out of the busy airports like Fort Lauderdale Executive, um, if you don't have the automation managed properly, I mean, it's there to help you. You can have one GPS on traffic, dedicated just to traffic. You can have one on a moving map, one on the CDI page. This is how we prefer to fly it. And we'll see people that will have um, a trip page on the MFD, the multifunction display. They'll have a GPS one set on airport frequencies, which we don't need while we're taking off. We've already got them preloaded. And then the GPS two will be on, on like terrain or something we definitely don't need flying out of Fort Lauderdale. And it'll stay that way until they get their minds caught back up with the aircraft, until they're out of the busy airspace and, and caught back up with the plane and got the power brought back and maybe engaged autopilot by then. Then they'll start to manage the, the automation, but then it's too late. They, they missed out on where they really needed the automation to work for them. I see a lot of that. Checklists are another thing. Checklists on these planes are, are on the MFD. Uh, so we don't use paper checklists, and even the emergency checklists are always there. Something goes wrong, that button's always there. Um, you know, and a checklist is not a do list. Uh, you don't have to sit there and go, door closed, door closed. You know, you got to manage that a little bit. But what you see a lot of people do is they'll, they'll dutifully do the checklist, and we teach them to have the climb checklist up before they take off, and then switch back over to the engine page so you got the checklist there ready when you need to do it. And I usually point out when we would land back at the airport that they dutifully set that up and never went back to it, and it's still there. It's, it's kind of interesting that uh, people will ignore that functionality. Yeah, they do. And sometimes I'm talking about high-time people here. I'm not talking about, you know, a 20-hour guy that's doing that. Well, managing the automation, that's the biggest, biggest key to flying the aircraft, really. Yeah. I never flew for the airlines. Uh, there's some guys in, in our building that did, and... Uh, They've told me that's one of the biggest things that you know they they teach with their with their pilots is when to properly manage the automation, when to use it, when not to use it, and uh, that's something that's kind of coming into this small aircraft flying. Uh, ability to properly configure the avionics for the current flight conditions. Um, that's what I was just talking about a little bit ago. Yeah, the uh, you know if you're you got a lot of things you can use in that plane, and you need to decide which one should be up when. And you don't see people doing that. You know, if you, the terrain function, you know, that's on, on like an Avidine system with the, with the Garmin 430s, you don't need that taking off out of, out of Florida at eight foot, you know, eight feet above sea level. Traffic's more important because there's a lot of airplanes. But, you know, if I was taken out of Aspen at night or something, I guess I would put everything on terrain. And how many other airplanes are out there? None. So, you know, we don't have to worry about that so much. And you got to use a little bit of common sense about it. Sometimes I tell people that, you know, they, they want to get into this rote memorization about what the book says do. Uh, and you need to just stop sometimes, because they do need to know what the book says, but at the same time they need to, to stop. And let's use common sense, what matters the most right now. Anything else you want to add to that? No, that's key, what matters the most right, right now. It's common sense. You don't even have to be a pilot, you know. So prop, proper knowledge of procedures by CFIs, pilots, and DPEs. That's what it boils down to. There is a proper procedure in an Avidine equipped Cirrus when the PFD fails. There's a known thing you're supposed to do. One good answer. And there's a different answer depending on how the planes are configured. And they, there, I can't go over all that here in a short amount of time. But if you're going to teach in these things, you need to make it your business to know. And if you're, a, if you're a DPE, you need to make it your business to know. Or you're not properly examining the applicant. Which brings me to this kind of strange slide. that doesn't seem to have a whole lot to do with this. But uh, Cirrus has done a good job of controlling this. And, I, and now as time goes by, I use this analogy because it's what I think we're going to see in the future. You got a guy who goes out and he buys himself a used airplane. So let's say it is a Cirrus. You know, now he's not in the system. When they pick him up at the factory, they're in the system and there's some control over them. And there's, um, 
you know, they're, they're told to use Cirrus instructors. Insurance companies are going to require it. So they're going to have to get somebody that knows what they're doing. So then you get the, this guy with this used airplane, and he gets a guy that gives him a big talk, but really doesn't know what he's doing. And he's, he's teaching him in this thing. And he's an instrument guy. All right, so if it's VFR, it's not such a big deal. And like with, you know, if Tina and I teach somebody, I know they're taught to such a high, much higher level than the PTS that I can send them to any examiner. I don't care how much they know or don't know. I feel safe when they get their sign off because I know they're way past PTS standards. But in this scenario, you got a guy like that, and then he goes to a DPE that maybe this is the first time he's ever done a glass cockpit checkout, and nothing's stopping him from doing it. And so he does it. And he's an instrument rated guy doing an instrument checkout. And so nobody ever taught this guy the right thing, and nobody ever examined him whether he knew it. And I think we're going to have more and more of this uh, out there. And so uh, we're trying to get more DPEs that have glass cockpit experience and, and really know the systems of these airplanes. Well, we see a lot of this go on. Yeah. We have a lot of these people show up at our doorstep. Um, and some of it's been frightening. We've had the cl clients show up, the aircraft owners. We've had the instructors show up who've been teaching in these used aircraft and have never, never had the proper instruction themselves. And there's a lot of them out there, and it's, it's pretty scary. Yeah, if you want to learn how to fly one of these planes, really do your homework if you're a pilot and seek out the advice of other people that have done it and find somebody that really knows this equipment because you're just not, you're wasting your money learning from somebody that doesn't know the equipment properly. Um, it's, it's very important, and there's just not that many people yet, I think, that are really highly skilled at it. There's a few. Anything you want to add to that one? There's our contact information again. You can email either one of us down there, and we're happy to take all the questions we can. Uh, instructors that want to learn how to teach in these things, um, we can offer a lot of tips on how to go about that and uh, get you started in it. But if anybody has any questions, we'll be happy to, happy to answer them. We got a mic for this gentleman over here. Don't ask me anything I don't know. Great, <laughs> uh, it's a great briefing. There's a lot of information that's, that's not known and a lot of factors that aren't uh, appreciated. As you mentioned, one of the controlling factors really are the insurance companies. So what do they look for? What are the requirements, hours, or, or sign-ups that they require before they'll let somebody take a, a glass cockpit airplane? Okay. The, um, it depends on what airplane it is. Um, the, the simpler 172s, for example, sometimes, I, I mean, I, I see anything. I mean, they can, if they've never even flown it, the insurance company doesn't ask anything. Yeah, of, of I've it. seen that too. Uh, and the more high uh, complex airplanes that are faster, um, Cirrus is in particular, I know, and I'm sure Colum uh, the, new, the Columbia 400, now Cessna, is the same way. Any of those, the insurance company is going to be more strict about it. The, the uh, 22s, they want you to have a, a lot of times an instrument rating before um, they'll let you go. Sometimes they'll let you be private pilot with no passengers in a 22. So I've even seen um, a gentleman who had, you know, I don't know, 800. 800, 1200 hours in a, in a Bonanza that he used to own, bought a used Sirius SR-22, and his insurance company said that all he needed was 10 hours in the aircraft. That, that was it. No specifics on a Sirius instructor or on anything. Just 10 hours in, in make and model, and he was good to go. Do you think the FAA, working with industry, should come up with some sort of uh, endorsement or glass type rating or something along the lines of, of uh, panel specific um, There's actually been a lot of discussion about that, um, especially in regard to the instrument rating. You know, someone gets an instrument rating in a glass panel plane, they're, they're still instrument rated. They can go get in that 172 Warrior and go, go take it up IMC. So there has been a lot of talk about that, but those things are very slow hard, motion. hard to regulate. Yeah, it's gonna be, even if they decided to do it, I think it'd be a slow process. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, do the manufacturers have uh, programs set up to train the trainers, and are they 
sort of at the corporate level of sponsorship or can an individual sign up and pay on the dotted line? Do you want to talk to that one or anything? You can. I can, the, uh, I can talk more intelligently about the Cirrus one because that's one I'm involved in. But uh, yeah, to be an official CSIP, Cirrus Standardized Instructor Pilot, you have to be taught by them. Uh, up until recently they were contracted by the University of North Dakota to do that and that was the only way you could be an independent Cirrus instructor. Now us having a training center we can teach uh, our instructors to be Cirrus instructors but they're only Cirrus instructors as long as they remain under our watch and under our roof. So um, uh, I, I know that Cessna has a, a program for teaching glass cockpit to instructors. I went through a version of that way back um, but I don't know about all manufacturers, so I don't think... Beechcraft is now working something, at least they are here in Florida, um, where if you're getting like the Bonanza with the G1000, they do have a program to get people through, which is similar to this 10 hours, 10, 12 hours in the aircraft, because I know one of the pilots, one of the instructors that's doing it. But you can go sign on the dotted line and, and take the training. You might, you might have to find an aircraft to do it in, yeah, that's the that, that can be a problem. That's they, the, they might not be able to provide you with an aircraft. Um, like to be a serious instructor, that's one of the kind of problems. You gotta, you say, I say problems, I think it's a good thing actually. You gotta have time, a lot of time in the plane before you can, not a lot, but a bit of time in the plane before you can even do the training, the instructor program. And then the instructor program takes a good bit of time. And then like I say, it's only a year's designation and then you gotta renew it. Uh, through either, they change it every year, online tests, going to uh, the annual convention or something. But it's good, it keeps us up to date. I, you get a lot of satisfaction out of finishing the training too. Um, it's such a good program. When you finish that transition training, and especially as an instructor, you know the aircraft inside out and backwards, and you really have the confidence that you know you can get out there, get in it the next day or, or the next week, and, and teach somebody about it or take it somewhere. And it's very beneficial. It's a really good program. Well, that's one thing I'd like to add. For people who hadn't done that transition training, it's a, such a, well, a good course. We get people that come to us that have no interest in flying that plane. They have their own plane of another manufacturer, but they've heard the quality of that course and how it teaches you to aeronautical decision making and make good decisions. And they'll take the course even though they're not going to be renting the planes. They're going to go back to their own airplane and fly it. So. Kind of different if you hadn't done it. Another fellow there in the middle. For a person yeah, with no flying experience, goes out and buys a Cirrus. Uh, what flight times do you expect, or do you normally find before they solo, get their private, and an instrument? That's that's a great question, and what we have found is a student pilot starting in the Cirrus. Um, I usually break the rating down into thirds. In, in, the, in the general typical aircraft that people learn in, you solo in the first third, um, and then you continue learning about cross country and so forth in the second third, and then the third, the last year we're brushing up on maneuvers. What we found that in the Cirrus, you're not gonna solo until the last third of your training um, because the aircraft is so, um, it's just less tolerant for air, especially learning to land it. You really have to learn to land it properly, which then translates to landing any aircraft properly. Um, but by the time the individual solos in the Cirrus, that person, he or she, can literally get in it. They're, they're done with their training. They can get in it and fly confidently just about anywhere in the U.S. and deal with just about any airspace, any ATC, any 